In April 1775, the first shots have been fired of the American Revolution at the Battle of Lexington. News of the fighting and the unexpected British defeat spreads like wildfire across North America. In an astonishing turn of events, American colonists are now besieging the British army in Boston, and both sides are primed and ready for a second encounter to settle scores and land a decisive blow. Many patriots leave the city and join the growing number of colonial militias, while loyalists pour into Boston from the countryside for protection, with some joining loyalist units attached to the British army. The fighting has followed years of civil disagreements over the British Parliament's right to introduce laws and taxes in the colonies without their representation. After Lexington, many colonists feel betrayed by His Majesty's army, and militias and civil leaders spring into action to remove loyalist authority where they can. Royal governors struggle to resist, and most loyalists go underground. In the weeks after the battle, British military arsenals are seized, including the poorly defended Fort Ticonderoga in New York on the 10th of May, 1775. Vital cannon are captured, which include heavy mortars and howitzers the colonial forces will desperately need in the coming conflict. On the same day, the Second Continental Congress begins in the city of Philadelphia. Congress is slowly taking charge of the situation as they become the de facto government of the 13 colonies and vote to borrow money, recruit new regiments and purchase essential supplies like gunpowder. Although the majority of delegates still favour reconciliation with Great Britain, the Battle of Lexington has shaken those prospects. And in June, with no sign of the British Parliament removing the intolerable acts or negotiating, Congress votes to create the Continental Army, with George Washington as its new Commander-in-Chief. The British forces, commanded by General Gage, remain bottled up in Boston, low on supplies. Gage abandons Charlestown, an unusual decision given the strategic value of the heights overlooking Boston. He also offers a pardon to the colonial forces if they lay down their arms except for the leadership, which only serves to inflame tensions further. The British government, now distrustful of Gage's ability to command, sends Generals Howe, Clinton and Burgoyne, along with reinforcements, to keep a watchful eye over Gage. For the time being, Gage remains in overall command of the 6,000-strong British force. And in June, realising his mistake, or attempting to satisfy his new lieutenants, he resolves to both reoccupy Charlestown and fortify the southern Dorchester Heights. Gage theorises that he can use these bases as a staging ground to push out and break the siege, which followed by a swift battlefield victory outside of Boston, may well end the war before it's truly begun, saving the situation and his reputation. Although the newly named Continental Army still lacks the training, equipment and organisation of its counterpart, at 15,000 strong, it remains a force to be reckoned with. Continental forces also control an excellent intelligence network inside of the city, and within days of the British plans to seize the heights being agreed, the commander of the Continental Army, General Artemis Ward, is aware and he moves to stop the British. Although his army does not yet possess heavy cannon, General Ward is well aware that if he can occupy the heights with guns, he can quickly make the British position in Boston untenable by bombarding both the city and crucial British supplies that can only arrive by sea. Both armies understand the importance of control of the heights for victory in Boston, but since the earlier British withdrawal, the peninsula has remained a no-man's land, watched over cautiously by the Royal Navy. There are two main hills on the peninsula, Bunker Hill to the north 
and Breed's Hill to the south, overlooking Boston. Breed's Hill stands at 75 feet in height, with a steep slope on its east bank. The peninsula itself is small, at a little over a mile long and wide, with access restricted by a narrow land corridor known as the Neck. Charlestown itself lies mostly abandoned, and the hay growing in the fields has not been harvested, leaving waist-high grass that conceals broken terrain, fences, clay pits and swamps. In the early hours of the 17th of June, and the day before Gage plans to take the heights, Colonel William Prescott leads two Massachusetts regiments of 1,000 men onto the peninsula. Mostly without uniforms, the men wear civilian dress and carry entrenchment tools, wicker baskets, and one day's ration per soldier. Although ordered to fortify Bunker Hill, Prescott instead orders a redoubt to be built on Breed's Hill, likely because of its commanding views over Boston. Prescott and his men dig trenches and an impressive square fortification with earthed walls and firing platforms 130 feet wide. The Continentals work at pace throughout the night and as day starts to break, they are soon spotted by Royal Navy ships who open fire on their position. British Commander Gage wakes to the sound of guns. Looking out across the bay, he is well aware of the danger and knows that he must control the heights if he is to stay in Boston, let alone break the siege. Although urged to act quickly, he takes his time and debates with his commanders the best course of action. General Clinton advises to take advantage of the narrow passage to the peninsula and land behind the Continental forces to take control of the Neck, besieging the Continental positions until they are forced to surrender. But Gage, following military doctrine of the day, does not want to expose his men to attack from two sides, and opts instead for a simpler and bloodier direct assault of Breed's Hill. The troops are marshalled in Boston, and in the early afternoon, Gage orders General Howe to lead 2,000 British regulars and storm the heights. The British row across the bay in longboats, their bayonets glinting in the hot sun. At 1pm, companies of light infantry, grenadiers and marines begin landing to the east of Charlestown. Both sides call for reinforcements and Continental forces from Connecticut arrive to reinforce Prescott's left flank where they hastily build fletches, breastworks and trenches. Over 3,000 men of the new Continental Army are now spread across the hills, including almost 2,000 concentrating around Breed's Hill. The British plan to envelop the redoubt by pushing through Continental defences along the right flank, while distracting and pinning the forces in the centre with a faint frontal assault. After sweeping aside the defending forces from Connecticut, the Continental forces on the redoubt will become isolated and attacked from the front and rear, leading to a swift British victory. Before the attack begins, Continental snipers are spotted in Charlestown and the order is given for Royal Navy ships to bombard the town, setting it ablaze. General Howe, like Gage, is underestimating the colonial forces and dismisses both their ability and resolve. Reflecting this attitude, he decides to arrange the majority of his men in line formations for the attack. For 18th century warfare, line formations were typically employed for straightforward battlefield engagements where a wide front of men, two to four ranks deep, presented more men to the enemy, maximizing firepower while staying cohesive enough to 
charge an enemy with bayonets. Blind formations are slow moving and vulnerable at the flanks and rear. But trained troops can quickly organize into squares to defend against cavalry attack. During the American Revolution, infantry would come to dominate the battlefield as both sides struggle to maintain large cavalry formations. For attacking fortified positions, military doctrine of the day dictated advancing in a column formation, moving as a narrow body of men to reduce frontal casualties and pack a concentrated punch to the enemy upon contact. The majority of soldiers on both sides use similar flintlock muskets, with the brown bess being the most common. These were typical muskets of the age and can be fired three to four times per minute by a trained soldier who could be expected to hit a target 50% of the time at 300 feet or 90 meters away. Many colonials also use more modern rifles that have twice the range of muskets but are slower to load at one shot per minute. Because of the low accuracy of muskets, experienced forces will often wait to fire until they get within 150 feet of an enemy to release as deadly a volley as possible. At 3 p.m., the attack begins. General Howe leads his men from the front as the main attack drives forward on the right flank. Royal Welsh Fusiliers lead the way, but they are slowed down by carrying their full packs and negotiating the difficult terrain in front of them. As the British forces advance, they pause for artillery pieces to fire, which do little damage to the entrenched continental positions. The colonial forces wait patiently until the British are just 100 feet away before finally opening fire. At that range, they are able to devastate the British ranks, who are easy targets in their slow-moving line formations. 100 Fusiliers are immediately killed and many more wounded at the front of the assault, which first falters and then disintegrates as the British fall back in disarray. The secondary attack on the redoubt is met in a similar fashion, made worse by remaining snipers in Charlestown and the heat from the afternoon sun as the soldiers march up the hill in wool uniforms. British forces withdraw as the attack ends in failure and General Howe regroups his men to the east of Charlestown. General Howe prepares a second assault, this time ordering a full attack on the redoubt instead of just a feint, to be combined with a closer supported attack from the right. Howe still hopes to push through continental lines and envelop the redoubt to capture or destroy the centre of colonial resistance. As the British march past dead and wounded comrades, they come within range of continental forces who once again open up withering fire. Resting rifles and muskets along their entrenched positions, the Continental forces make easy pickings of the British, whose officers decide to pause and reply with volley after volley of ineffectual fire instead of pushing on and directly assaulting the positions. They are once again thrown back with heavy casualties. But there is also now confusion in the continental ranks as critical reinforcements arrive but remain directionless on Bunker Hill while many others flee the field. Fresh supplies are also not coming through, leaving Prescott and his remaining men on Breed's Hill, now less than 1,000, running dangerously low on ammunition. Before a third assault can begin, 
400 British reinforcements arrive from Boston, accompanied by an eager General Clinton, who rallies a further 200 wounded to form up for the next attack. Howe, lightly shaken by the high casualties, now changes the formation of his men to columns and orders one large attack to be directed solely at the redoubt on Breed's Hill. He tells his men to drop their heavy packs and use their deadly bayonets, which the Continental Army, now short on ammunition, does not possess in large numbers. Where the British have come to fear the deadly accuracy of Continental rifle fire, the Continentals fear the cold steel bayonets of the regulars. The British feint a small attack on the right, but the majority of the men now charge up the hill with their bayonets ready. Officers encourage their men forward, shouting for them to push on as artillery pounds the colonial positions. This time, the concentration and speed of the assault shows results, and the regulars begin to breach the redoubt. But Continental troops, using their muskets as clubs, are waiting for them, and brutal hand-to-hand -hand combat follows. The Continental commander, Colonel Prescott, is in the thick of the fighting as he parries bayonets with his sabre. But with superior training and weaponry, the British have a significant advantage and begin to push the Continentals back while inflicting heavy casualties. Prescott and his men give way and retreat from the hill. But it is not a rout and the Continental forces are able to fall back to Bunker Hill in good order, covered in part by their left flank. General Clinton, eager not to let the Continental forces reorganize on Bunker Hill, starts preparing British troops for a fresh attack. But before it can be launched, the Colonials begin to withdraw. The majority of Prescott's men are disorganized or retreating, but after a brutal day of fighting, they've done enough. The Continental Army has been forced from the field, but at a high price. British casualties are over 1,000 dead and wounded, approximately 40% of their total forces engaged. Continental losses are far lighter, at 450 dead, wounded and captured. Both sides have made blunders during the battle. The British, for a second time in the campaign, have underestimated their opponents, while General Gage acted too slowly in the morning giving the Continental Army the time it needed to prepare and reinforce. Strategically, had Gage opted for General Clinton's plan to surround the Continental positions and make best use of the Royal Navy, a far less costly victory could have been won. General Howe, for his part, made poor tactical choices, attacking in line formation and unnecessarily splitting his forces across a wide front line. For the new Continental Army, despite performing well, the force still lacks military discipline. Orders are ignored and disobeyed, much needed supplies do not arrive, and high levels of desertion dramatically weaken the front at crucial moments during the battle. Two weeks later in July, the newly appointed commander of the Continental Army, General George Washington, arrives in Cambridge and begins to reorganize the free-spirited militia into a professional fighting force. The army he inherits is ill-disciplined, with poorly dug trench lines, low supplies and dirty living quarters. They talk to their British opponents along outposts and many come and go from the camp as they please. Washington quickly removes officers, holds court-martials, and lashes men that do not follow his orders. He tells his men that they are now fighting for Congress and the United Provinces of North America. By September, his new entrenchments are ready and fresh gunpowder has arrived. Washington, energetic and keen to take the fight to the British, proposes an ambitious, amphibious assault through the south of Boston, rowing his men into the city. But his senior officers disagree as too high of a risk, 
and Washington yields to their judgment. Despite the bloody fighting at Bunker Hill, Congress is still divided. John Dickinson, an influential delegate from Pennsylvania, leads the majority in still seeking peace and reconciliation with Great Britain. In July, Congress sends a final petition to King George III, affirming their loyalty and asking for a lasting settlement that removes Parliament's undemocratic authority over the colonies. Congress hopes the petition will open negotiations, but by the time the letter arrives, the King, having heard of the events at both Lexington and Bunker Hill, has already signed the Proclamation of Rebellion and will not read the petition from Congress. The proclamation declares the colonies to be in a state of rebellion and orders officials from across the empire to suppress the traitors by force. Although many on both sides of the Atlantic still wish to avoid civil war, the proclamation has severely weakened the hand of delegates like John Dickinson and his Whig supporters in Parliament, and reconciliation seems more and more unobtainable. Days after news of the battle reaches London, Gage is recalled to Britain in relative disgrace. There were already concerns about his ability to command, and Bunker Hill is the final straw. General William Howe replaces him as the British commander in North America. Aside from the high casualties, the Battle of Bunker Hill dramatically changes British calculations. Howe is deeply affected by the battle and has a new respect for the Continental Army. By winter, the Continental forces have shrunk due to enlistments ending and desertions, and the British, with fresh reinforcements, now have 10,000 men in Boston. Although Howe now outnumbers Washington for the first time in the campaign, he now does not want to risk an attack. General Howe has problems of his own. Poor morale is leading to desertion, as his men suffer through the winter with a lack of firewood, proper quartering, and fresh food that can only come in from the sea, and which is often captured by colonial privateers. Despite the perceived opportunity, the British command has become overly cautious, just as they gain the opportunity to go on the offensive. Washington is acutely aware that as winter drags on, his army will weaken. He proposes two further direct assaults on Boston, one in October and one in February, that would have seen Continental forces rush across the iced over bay to attack the city. But again, his senior officers disagree and the plans are scrapped. A stalemate now exists between the cautious General Howe and the restrained Washington. But in November, Henry Knox, a 25-year-old bookseller, with an interest in military history, suggests a way to bring heavy cannon to the army and end the siege, Fort Ticonderoga. Washington dispatches Knox with orders to bring the heavy guns to Boston, but this is no easy feat, as the 59 cannons selected weigh over 60 tons. Knox builds sledges that will move the cannon through the deep snow and unforgiving countryside and transport the precious cargo 300 miles in what will become known as the Noble Train of Artillery. In March 1776, Washington places his new heavy artillery on the Dorchester Heights, a no man's land up until that point, which finally threatens to bombard both the city and Royal Navy ships. General Howe recognises the danger and plans to assault the Heights, but a storm scatters his landing boats and makes an attack impossible. The British now have no choice but to evacuate the city. Over almost a year of fighting, the British have wasted precious time in Boston, fighting an unnecessary siege that they refused to break. But a new strategy is now emerging in the British High Command, and with fresh reinforcements finally arriving from Europe, Howe is now poised to turn the tide in 1776 and finally go on the offensive. Thank you for watching our series on the American Revolution. Join us again soon for future videos, and if you liked our channel and want to support us grow, please consider liking and subscribing. 
Until next time, 